Hello, my name is Kevin Anikowski, and this episode is on relationships. All right, today we are discussing relationships. So my advice, not worth your time. No, I'm just kidding. But in actuality, let's first talk about Sternberg's triangle model of love. There are three components, thus the triangle. First is intimacy. It's present in most relationships. Simply, it's just liking the person, like a good friend. Then you can move towards the other two points. First is passion. Second is commitment. So passion is, of course, analogous to lust, whereas commitment is the commitment to the relationships. So these are all pretty straightforward. But like a couple that stays together for the kids, commitment only is often an empty love, lacking intimacy and passion. There are seven love types depending on your triangle location, but a relationship with all qualities, so intimacy, passion, and commitment, is called consummate love. The other ones are less high yield. So how do we choose who we like? Well, of course, this is a loaded question, but some MCAT topics can help shed light on the matter. First, we need to say who we won't choose. The repulsion hypothesis argues we prefer people similar to us but are repulsed by those who aren't. The repulsion hypothesis defies the laws of physics of opposites attract and likes repel. So who do we like? How about the people that like us? That's what the concept of reciprocal liking would say. When someone likes you, you tend to like them more. Hey, they like me. Well, obviously it's because they have good taste, so they must be a pretty cool person. Now, I ask you, is your romance, your future, or current significant other, or your relationship, is it all fate? Well, the pompacuity effect would say it's not. It's not by chance you tend to find someone close. Your chances of dating the person sitting adjacent to you in class is your statistically significant other, at least according to probability. The pompacuity effect states that the more we see and meet someone, the more likely we are to like them. I'm sure you're thinking of the mere exposure effect right now. Do you remember what the other name for it is? Exactly, the familiarity effect. Have you ever found someone really attractive then, as they're grabbing their coffee, they spill it on themselves? Oh no! All of a sudden you're like, wow, that person is really attractive. Well, that's called the pratfall effect. Basically, you already like them. Anything to make them more human makes you want them more. But if you didn't already like them, then anything to make them more human actually just makes them worse. Next, there is an interesting phenomenon in which we tend to like people more if they originally didn't like us, then later developed an interest in us compared to somebody who was always interested in us. This is called the gain-loss principle. This is true in other relationship scenarios as well, but it's applicable here. Of course, many, many, many factors are at play, but other ones are discussed in other episodes. But hey, we're all about equality, right? So we want a relationship to reflect that, you know? How about 60-40? Just kidding. But how would you keep track of a 50-50 relationship? Well, social exchange theory is one way you can do so. Social exchange theory argues how we feel about our relationship and the person depends on the social exchanges we each put in, such as time, money, emotional support, etc. But let's be honest, our cognitive biases are probably going to kick in and make us think that we're putting in more than we actually are. But hey, At least for many men, I'm sure that they're willing to do as much work as their partner wants in exchange for, um, certain favors. It's kind of like a contingency contract, if you will, which involves some form of agreement between two parties. Like you and your parents about your grades. If certain criteria are met, say getting B's or above, you can go out as much as you want. But should you fault, then you become restricted to staying inside. Contingency contracts are used in multiple types of relationships. And finally, the less happy part of this episode, what happens when we lose a loved one? Well, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross outlined five stages in her Kubler-Ross model of grief. I have a mnemonic for it. Think about it. If you lose someone, you'll be tearing up a ton, right? And you'll want to dab those tears away, right? Well, think of the repeated word dab-dab as an acronym. The stages in order are D for denial, A for anger, B for bargaining, and D again for depression, and lastly A again for acceptance. 
the last B in dab dab wasn't really used and doesn't really stand for anything. But my friend was like, oh, it, it stands for bye. And I'm like, bye? Well, why bye? And she goes, yeah, because, you know, when you find someone new, all your thoughts of that other person go, bye. And I said, okay, whatever. Now, do you remember the stages in order? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, bye.